possible. Also, the Economic Development Division, who is sponsoring today's webcast. As you can see, we have a few webcasts coming up uh, in the next few months. Um, to register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcast and register for your webcast of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter on at planning webcast to receive up-to-date information on the planning webcast series sponsored by chapters, chapters divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM, select today's date, Thursday, September 8th, and then select today's webcast, what economic development planners should know about eco-industrial development. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available along with a six slide per page PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. At this time, I would like to in introduce Peter Lowett. Peter Lowett has been the director of the Devons Enterprise Commission, which handles the reuse of the former Fort Devons, Massachusetts since 1999. Prior to his current position, he was the director of planning and economic development for the town of Londonderry, New Hampshire. He has held many roles in the leadership of the American Planning Association. He is a past president of the APA Massachusetts chapter and past chair of the APA Economic Development Division. He holds a master's degree in urban environmental policy from Tufts University and a bachelor's in history from Brown University. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us today. All right. So our agenda today, I'm going to look at the role of the American Planning Association in eco-industrial development, talk a little bit about the concept of eco-industrial development, delve into why we as economic development planners should be interested in the topic, talk about uh, the definition of linkages, and give us a case study to sink our teeth into. So what's the definition? Uh, the definition of eco-industrial development is an integrated system of shared resources. These can be materials, they can be knowledge, they can be social connections. And it's shared among industries, businesses, and the local community. And the goal is economic gain, enhanced environmental quality, and a better social equity position for businesses and the community. APA has specific policies in place which address eco-industrial development. Those can be found in the 2008 Policy Guide on Climate Change. And they talk about efficient use of resources. And they also talk about uh, having new energy generating facilities be set up to anchor eco-industrial parks through the cascading of resources. An example might be a power plant that has excess steam, which is used to heat an aquaculture uh, facility that raises both hydroponic uh, vegetables and uh, aquaculture as well. The Economic Development and Environmental Natural Resource Divisions help publish an eco-industrial development guide, which can be found on both of these divisions' websites. Uh, this is a members-only uh, asset. If you're a member of either of those two divisions, you can download this uh, content. And it's sort of a how-to guide to create eco-industrial parks in the U.S. and a number of case studies that you can see on the screen. So I usually like to start these talks by looking at the rose or a plant and talking about how is a plant 
like the rose, like a plant, like a manufacturing facility, and get you all thinking about inputs and outputs, the role of scavengers and decomposers in a system. And then jumping from looking at the microcosm of the plant, we look at the system. How is a park like an industrial park? And bearing in mind uh, these concepts, let's, let's sort of uh, look at the goals for eco-industrial development. And as planners, I think we can all sort of get behind the promoting vibrant, diverse communities aspect. Working within nature's limits, we can think about carrying capacity, promoting collaboration and networking, and as economic developers, we're thinking about how all of this can add value to the locations where we work and for the communities in which we work. For an eco-industrial park, that could look like networked businesses that promote business partnerships. It could look like improved environmental performance for those, for those businesses located within the park, and above average return on assets. A lot of that comes about through minimizing waste and using our resources more efficiently. So again, promoting vibrant and diverse communities, that's pretty straightforward here. And again, maximizing fairness and efficiency in the distribution of resources. It's resource efficiency, which is what we're getting at with all of these uh, goals. And why is that important? Well, consumer preference surveys will show us that consumers favor environmental protection over economic development in most instances. And market research says that green products that are comparably priced are preferred by consumers over their competition. And the fact that we're engaged in worldwide competition here in North America. So this is really totally ripped from the headline, so to speak. I took this out of a airplane, uh, British Airways, when I was flying back from Europe. And it really speaks to me, collaborate or die. Is that what we're really faced with? Well, there are lots of benefits of collaboration. And I think it's the ability to sort of grow your resource base without adding people that attracts a lot of folks. You can get additional perspectives on ideas, and you develop common information in a common database. Plus, you're developing a trusting relationship. Some of the characteristics of collaboration include open sharing of information, local involvement, identification of shared needs, and a commitment to act among the partners. So what I, what I often joke about is that with an eco-industrial park, what we're really trying to do is mandate cooperation. We're trying to set up instances where businesses can interact with each other. And a lot of these are informal interfaces. So it could be around a child care center. It could be integrating a cafeteria into a eco-industrial park could be a shared conference room, could be a community room such as at the Eco-Industrial Park at, in Londonderry where AES Granite Ridge, which is a power plant, has a community room which they share with uh, the businesses and the community in the area. Also, recreational uh, sporting leagues can be ways to create this opportunity for interaction. So what we find uh, from looking at the data is, is that when you have a diversity of businesses within a park, you have a greater chance of having byproduct exchanges and shared resources. So why should we be interested in this? And I think the bottom line comes down to value added. And it's thinking about turning one firm's waste stream into a revenue stream. Some of the earlier academic studies estimated that 
there could be a 20 to 30 percent efficiency gain from locating in an eco-industrial park over a traditional park. There haven't been a lot of studies since those initial ones, so I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is, but I know that there is a market advantage from my own experience. So you can look at things like cooperative pur purchasing, cooperative marketing, cooperative incubator services, a lot of things that we as economic development planners are already doing, and taking a look at recycling. All of these make a difference and they add value, often not found in traditional parks. So there are a lot of areas where we can collaborate within a park. Some of those could be uh, communications uh, systems. So there would be a uh, network that could be shared both in the park and outside of the park. Material exchanges, transportation. Uh, one firm's truck uh, goes out and delivers to a client in another state and it comes back empty. Another firm in the park has a client along the transportation route, picking it up, bringing it back, efficiency, resources saved, money saved. Environmental health and safety here at Devons, we have an environmental health and safety networking group. Uh, they do shared training together. A uh, large company, Bristol Myers, shares its systems and mentors smaller companies. All of these are things that can be put into play in a network within a park or in a community. So marketing, I'm going to go into that in a second. Uh, shared production processes. We actually had a shared employee between two transportation companies that needed, uh, both of whom needed part-time drivers, and they were able to collaborate. So shared marketing. Uh, this is sort of a really cool product. Uh, preserve toothbrushes, which are made from number five uh, plastic. And the number five plastic is found in Stonyfield yogurt cups. So Stonyfield uh, takes their cups. They have a product take-back system. You can send them their, their cups back. Those cups are then melted down and made into the handles for the preserved toothbrush. Preserved toothbrush has a little folder you can go online and they'll mail it to you and then you can mail your toothbrush back when you're done with it. They take the bristles off, they melt it down and they make it into plastic lumber. Isn't that, what a great concept. Well, those companies, Preserve, Stonyfield, added a couple of partners, Toms of Maine and Brita water, water Filters, and they're all cooperating together under this uh, marketing brand called Give Me Five. And they're asking you to send them your number five plastics. And it, it's pretty neat. Now, Stonyfield was in the London area going industrial park that I started, and I recruited Britta in. Britta left sometime later, but they've maintained this uh, networking relationship. So how can we as economic developers sort of explore the opportunities? And I've included this sort of tool that you can use to brainstorm around linkages. So you have a product and a company. And these are some of the areas I'll let you uh, look at at your leisure when you download uh, this to examine opportunities for collaborating among companies and finding links and connections. I'll take, give you an example of uh, a connection here from Devons. So Gillette has an 800,000 square foot warehousing facility that's located on, in the building on the left. On the right is Sonico, which does just-in-time packaging for Gillette, and there's actually a connector building in between. So some of the areas where they collaborate, uh, they have shared security for the two buildings. They have uh, 
Sonico's building is heated by the process heat from their packaging equipment, and some of the extra heat is shared with uh, Gillette's building. Gillette, in turn, uh, helps fund some of our local nonprofits, including a women's shelter and a food pantry. Now, unfortunately for us here at Devon's, uh, Gillette was bought by Procter & Gamble, and they ended up closing uh, the facility. So currently, the Gillette side of the building is occupied by, an, which is about 800,000 square feet, is occupied by Quiet Logistics, and the uh, Sonico side of the building is currently uh, vacant. So brainstorming around tourism and trying to identify linkages, this is an example of, of what we've come up with, uh, looking at transportation issues, figuring out where arts and crafts might fit in. This is just to, to get your juices flowing and let you think a little bit about how to use this tool. So marketing sustainability and eco-industrial benefits. This is pretty much what I use at Devon's here. Uh, we talk about benefits to the community, benefits to the environment, and economic benefits to the firms that are involved in the program. A lot of this uh, comes from the guidebook for eco-industrial park managers that uh, you can download from the division website. So byproduct exchanges, eco-industrial development. Where did all of this start? Often, we go back to Kalimborg, Denmark, which is an isolated industrial community on the same island that Copenhagen is on, except for it's on the far western part of the island. And they have a coal-fired power plant. They take the gypsum, which is left over from the uh, production process, and that goes to a uh, wallboard company, Giprock. Some of the heat from the power plant goes into a fish farm. The fly ash from the power plant goes into a cement manufacturer. There, uh, the extra heat produced uh, is turned into steam and becomes district heating for the neighboring municipality. There is uh, Novern IS, which makes uh, a number of uh, biogas plants and soil uh, amelioration. And uh, there's Novazines, which makes insulin. They actually have their own farmers uh, employed on their staff, and they take the sort of sludge from their production process and put that on farms in all over Denmark. But again, for liability issues, they have their own farmers. And all of this was really done to avoid uh, the use of surface water from Lake uh, Tasso. And uh, it's proven to be very effective. And this has been going on since uh, the mid-60s, when a group of students sort of uncovered the fact that these exchanges were going on, and the companies have been able to augment them over time. This is the, the same process with a few uh, pictures. Again, Novo Nortz, which is the insulin supply supplier, the city of Kalimborg, the gypsum manufacturer, uh, and Stat Oil Refinery, uh, which is an oil refinery located adjacent to the power plant. All of these come into play, and uh, you know, it leads me to my next uh, slide, which is my own sort of uh, what I call flowchart envy that we use here at Devon's, uh, trying to map out some of the exchanges between uh, companies who are located within our park. One of the things that makes it uh, Easy for us to easier for us to assess the opportunities is when companies come 
into our park, we ask them to and sit down with them and walk through sort of this flow diagram where they'll input their materials on one side, their non-product outputs on another, the products they produce, their water and energy requirements, and number of employees. And uh, feel free to uh, use this uh, for your own purposes, but it's been very effective for us. So in the U.S., we've probably got about uh, 30 different projects going on today. These are self-identified off of the web, uh, and it's going on in tw 23 different states at this point, and it ranges from, there are a number of them that are sort of power plant based, such as in Londonderry, and the Red Hills Ecoplex, in, uh, which is a project set up by TVA in Mississippi. There's some that focus on sort of clean environment, uh, and that's the Phillips Eco Enterprise Center in Minneapolis. Uh, in Burlington, there's a, a wired uh, power plant that only uses sustainable certified uh, uh, wood chips, and then it has the community gardens helping Burlington, Vermont, meet its goal of having fresh uh, vegetables and fresh locally grown food year round, so there's a bunch of uh, greenhouses associated with that. Devon's is uh, sort of a holistic attempt to redevelop a military base along the model of sustainable development. The Cabazon Resource Park is basically it's a, it's a resource recovery operation uh, run by an Indian tribe in California. There are a number of uh, success factors when you're dealing with eco-industrial development. Among those are the need for a project champion. Uh, you need someone who will implement as well as dream. You need to work with the existing industries as well as the ones you're trying to recruit in and work with institutions as well as, as industries. You can target your recruitment to look at uh, everything from reducing transportation between uh, similar uh, industries that trade with each other to looking at turning one firm's waste stream into another firm's source of raw materials, which is the sort of magic of eco-industrial development. Oftentimes you need a, a strong industry local government relationship. Need to look at the economic return for stakeholders. Uh, having a community as a partner has been a factor in a number of parks. Uh, taking small steps to start out works. And uh, doing some aggressive marketing, which I think we as economic development planners are fairly good at. This comes from my colleague Corey Brinkema from uh, Trillium Partners. So now we're going to take a look at a case study. I'm going to uh, delve into Devons. Devons is a former military base in north central Massachusetts. And we like to sell the added value of locating here. When Devons was closed, the concept of redeveloping it as an example of sustainable development became the organizing theme for the redevelopment of the park. In 1993, there was the charrette when the base closure was announced. And I'm always fascinated by the fact that in 1993, they were talking about zero waste industrial parks. And a no-waste system similar to a biological community, way ahead of its time. And this is what we're, we're trying to implement, this vision that came from the community here at Devons. So like any good planning project, sustainability starts by knowing what your local resources are. And in this case, we were able to start out by mapping the environmental characteristics of the base. And I don't think it's important to know what all of the lines are here. It's just to illustrate the fact that 
they were all taken into account and were part of the discussion. So you'll notice in the bubble diagram on the right-hand side of your screen that the rail and trade area is on top of a, a resource area. In this case, the resource is mostly an aquifer. So one of the things that this type of analysis enabled was a rational discussion between stakeholders around the idea that rail serviced lots in uh, the Northeast, let alone New England, are a scarce commodity. And there was a trade-off that was accommodated where the rail industrial and trade district had to have a much higher degree of water supply protection measures put in place. And in return for that, uh, development in this area was accommodated. So again, knowing the resources enabled the discussion to take place and trade-offs to be thoroughly discussed and vetted and decision makers able to make their decision. So Devons is 4,400 acres. Of that 4,400 acres, only 1,800 is scheduled to be developed. The balance is kept as open space. Some of that's active and some of it is passive. The active component is about 500 acres of fields, some of which you see covered in snow in the bottom picture. A 70-acre swimming area Mirror Lake, which you can see in the top right, but it also involves uh, the restoration of environmentally compromised areas. The picture on the left is daylighting a former culvert and turning it back into uh, an active stream. And the area in the bottom right is uh, an area that was remediated because of environmental contamination. At Devon's, close to 33% of our open space and of all of the land here, 33% of the entire 4,400 acres will be permanently protected through either conservation restrictions or gifts to uh, conservation agencies such as U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So we have open space. How do you treat it green as a green infrastructure asset and manage it? I love this example of composting our 50-acre Rogers Field, which was the former post parade ground. 1996, when the state of Massachusetts took title to the property, they were spending about $75,000 a year on fertilizer, 3 million gallons of water being used, and it had to be seeded three or four times a year. After nine after 2005, when we stopped uh, measuring, we were spending just shy of $8,000 for fertilizer, under 600,000 gallons of water a year, and we were doing 40 acres of top dressing with compost and core aeration. The only problems we encountered is we had to mow the darn stuff more often because it grew so uh, abundantly. Part of our open space includes a sustainable certified golf course. And sort of the design intent of the golf course uh, is really captured in the picture on the bottom left of the golf cart. Uh, cartway crossing a stream. The original site plan showed a straight bridge but they would have had to take out a couple of trees, so they curved it. The whole intent here is to reduce the amount of fertilizer and insecticide and herbicide that's being put onto the course. The course remains ranked as one of the top five courses in New England. It is gorgeous and uh, a real challenge to play. Really the most sustainable thing uh, you could do 
is to reuse existing buildings. And we have a fast track permitting system here at Devons which says if you're reusing an existing building, you get permits within 21 days and it's an administrative hearing. If you're uh, doing a regular development, we have a 75 day permitting window. And that also is an at value added attraction for development here. We have a housing component which requires 25% of the units to be affordable. We also have uh, a model uh, green housing program which has created uh, eight single family units which are zero energy housing which means that they produce as much energy as they consume. And those are designed to uh, be priced for people who can afford between 80 and 120 percent of the median income. So in Massachusetts, that's somewhere between 200 dollars and $350,000 for a single family house in the Boston area, which uh, isn't all that bad for this neck of the woods. Again, the third leg of the sustainable development puzzle is social equity. And here uh, we have some folks from the Job Corps working on creating a teen center for area use. We have a number of institutions which are in play. We have an adult daycare center. We have a child care center with slots reserved for working mothers in the area. Uh, we have a preschool and we have a museum. We have uh, a woman's shelter and we also have a food pantry, all of which are sort of our not NGO or institutional piece of the community. We have over 150,000 visitors a year to our recreation facilities. We have 5.4 million square feet of development that we've been able to attract, including a hotel and conference center. This is from 2006, and the numbers uh, have gone up and down because of the recession since then. Uh, we're probably as I said, up to about 5.4 million square feet of uh, commercial development, although there's about a million square feet which is vacant at the moment. We have about 3,500 jobs, and the uh, payroll numbers have yet to be updated uh, from 2006. But you can see it's actually a fairly impressive uh, track record. And one of the things that uh, we're very proud of is we were able to attract Bristol Myers Squibb uh, to locate their bio uh, far, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, facility here and invest 1.1 billion dollars to do that. So we've made some progress on a regulatory side we do a number of things in our regulations to enhance sustainability and eco-industrial development here. Among those are uh, we have low impact development uh, stormwater techniques which as you can see from this slide not only promote a more sustainable approach to development but they truly are cost effective in fact, in this one uh, redevelopment of a former military intelligence defense training building, the developer estimated they saved over $125,000 by using the low impact uh, development approach for managing their stormwater. Our future housing, uh, we're going to use LEED for neighborhood development. Uh, we are putting in place uh, some regulations around mitigating the climate impacts of uh, our industries. And uh, 
we are transit ready. We have commuter rail in proximity. I'll get into that in a minute. But what really makes us stand out and where we sort of link eco-industrial development back thoroughly into the Devon's case study is through a program we developed called EcoStar. Its mission is to promote sustainable development by integrating economic, social, and environmental needs. It's voluntary, non-prescriptive, and the businesses sort of pick out the goals that work for them and flow with them. We host workshops. We support uh, tools that enable more efficient use of resources and reduce costs. Basically, what we do is we help businesses to green their operations through a series of workshops and networking meetings. We developed the EcoStar Action Guide, which has 25 environmental criteria. And if a company gets 10 of the core criteria, including the linkage to another company, which is sort of the eco-industrial component, and five voluntary criteria, they become an eco-industrial achiever and can use the logo that you see at the bottom here, the achiever logo. We have a couple of achievers at this point. But our areas of focus range from helping a company craft an environmental vision and policy statement to helping them do specific climate change mitigation for their firm. We look at business linkages. We have educational opportunities where we help them look at how they can involve their employees, suppliers, and customers in their goal of being a greener organization. And we have uh, programs in place to help them improve their energy efficiency, reduce their water use, and the like. We have a series of roundtable forums that we've set up. Uh, I mentioned the Environmental Health and Safety Group before. They do a lot of uh, mentoring. Uh, we set up a meeting and provide the, uh, the breakfast food and location. They, at this point, have set up their own agenda and they meet uh, 10 times a year. We have what we call a compliance university, which is in place to help uh, the smaller companies review uh, the regulations that pertain to them regarding water pollution, air emissions, waste, and toxic chemicals. What regulations are there that pertain to each of these issues? And we go through what the federal regulations are, what the state regulations are, and what the local regulations are in a non-threatening educational format. Uh, they can ask questions, and there's a state agency that will come in and provide this assistance uh, in a non-threatening uh, manner. We have a green building group, which uh, shares their experiences on various green building projects, uh, including our zero net energy housing. And we have a group that looks at transportation efficiencies, which I mentioned earlier. Looking, having the logistics managers of different firms sit down together on, a, on an occasional basis to look at opportunities to collaborate in order to decrease costs. An example of this is my friend Gary Hirschberg, the CEO of uh, Stonyfield Yogurt. He was expanding Stonyfield down into the mid-Atlantic states when he noticed uh, a poultry truck driving up from Maryland, going to Hooksett, New Hampshire, which is a town away from Londonderry, where Stonyfield is located. He called their CEO, and they worked out a collaborative transportation uh, mechanism where the poultry company and the yogurt company will take yogurt down and bring poultry back. Uh, it's worked out. So far, they haven't, any, haven't had any complaints about poultry-flavored yogurt as yet. Transportation initiatives. Uh, Devons has a number of bike lanes that we've been developing. 
looking at ride sharing, uh, but where we've been most successful is working on the reverse commute along our commuter rail line. We've uh, received $150 million in small starts funding, additional funding from the Recovery Act, and our goal is to reduce the commute time from Fitchburg to Boston from an hour and a half to one hour. We're well on our way to achieving that. We hope to open uh, the new system in the uh, winter of 2013. Recycling services, again, we sort of look at things within a park. We actually go out to bid for recycling and waste hauling for all of the businesses in the park. And if uh, the waste managements and BFIs of the world want to keep their customers, they ended up dropping their rates to be competitive with the bid that we received. Smaller companies can use this drop-off, which uh, averages now about three tons of material a month being recycled. It's open to the public as well. One of our more recent successes has been launching a regional household hazardous waste facility. It's open to eight communities. Uh, Everyone has reduced costs while adding service and protecting the environment, which is a pretty rare thing in this economic uh, backdrop. The other aspect is this service is open to very small quantity generators of hazardous waste who are businesses who can drop their uh, material here for a fee. And byproduct exchange uh, just didn't sound sexy enough for us, so we gave it a new name. We called it the Great Exchange, and we have an event that we hold every couple of years or so where we invite businesses who have uh, materials to sit down in a room with their counterparts. In this particular case, we had 20 businesses over 30 people in the room. At the end of our two-hour session, we had over 32 exchanges between the 20 businesses. And again, uh, these are opportunities for doing joint purchasing, networking, and the like. For example, Kane's Food, who you see here, has become a huge uh, user of this service. They share their uh, plastic bags with prisons, municipalities, DPWs across the state. Some of their pails are used uh, by uh, art, uh, NGOs, and the like. One of the neater exchanges Kane does is they make mayonnaise and relish and salad dressing. And as long as their waste container contains at least 50% oil, a company from Lowell will come down with a vacuum truck, vacuum it up, and they make it into soap. Pretty cool. Waste turns into art. Uh, Donna, the director of our EcoStar program, calls the first Wednesday, Wednesday of every month Treasure Day. And they have a milk run with uh, this arts group from Boston, which comes out and picks up all these supplies from our various companies within the area. And they, in turn, become art supplies for teachers uh, in cash-strap programs across the Commonwealth. Packaging is another area where we have saved uh, and repurposed quite a number of products. You can see some of the results listed here. And again, these aren't all huge byproduct exchanges. They're small, but they add value for the companies that are participating in them. And they add value to locating in your community if you can deploy these types of resources and programs for your industries. The 30-yard container that I showed in an earlier picture by our 
DPW. Uh, in six months, it saved about $64,000 for the companies involved. We call this the gift that keeps on living because the exchanges create exchanges, and by word of mouth, they continue to grow. We just have a hard time documenting them with our small staff. We have other programs that we deploy with businesses. On the left, you see a lean and green manufacturing workshop that we worked on with EPA and the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. We have an Earth Day celebration. We do community betterment projects with our businesses giving back to the community. And we do field trips to educate folks uh, about opportunities for recycling, for green uh, building, and the like. Some of the goals that we've been able to accomplish are developing, developing mentoring relationships and partnerships through these roundtables. Our conference center has been selected by environmental groups because of its relationship and participation in EcoStar. And again, they're doing sort of the grow local, uh, uh, local farms to local tables uh, at the conference center. A giftware manufacturer was able to achieve a zero waste goal and was able to get new business uh, from uh, participating in the program. An aerospace systems manufacturer went through our energy conservation program and saved over $86,000. And again, uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb was happy to locate at Devon's because their corporate mission is sustainable development, and it meshed very well with uh, the Devon's mission. There were a lot of other things thrown at Bristol-Myers Squibb, but uh, we felt that that was part of what attracted them to come to Devon's. So if you want to learn more about what we're doing here, uh, you can look at our website, our EcoStar website. And I put out a irregular newsletter of eco-industrial development and industrial symbiosis, uh, which is another name for eco-industrial development. Uh, there are about 23 to uh, states with eco-industrial projects in the United States. There are about 30 different projects that I'm aware of today. And I'm planning on holding a conference for eco-parks in the U.S. in 2012. If you want to get onto our newsletter, feel free to email me. And what I'm going to do now is turn this back to Jennifer and hope that the what we've been experiencing before the program happened. Jennifer, you want to take this back? Jennifer? Anybody there? Anybody there? Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm here. All right. Um, uh, I'm not sure if everybody, uh, if Peter is able to hear. Uh, we were having a little bit of um, audio issues earlier today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to ask the questions, and I'll announce them over to the audience, and then um, I'll kind of send them to Peter. Um, Peter, actually, uh, people were asking to see the last slide that you uh, just had up. So if you would go back to that, that would be great. Hello. That was great. Did the whole thing and nothing happened. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. It'll just be a second, and then we'll get the um, question and answer started.
Okay, so our first question is going to be how old are the surveys that show public that show that the public is more interested in environment uh, than economic development um, pre-recession? So I'm sending that to Peter right now, and he should be able to answer that for everyone. All right, let's see if I can get this up for you folks. Sorry about this. Here's the contact information. Hopefully this uh, will work for you. Thanks. Okay, the uh, question about the surveys. The surveys were done uh, pre-recession. They were done by Stonyfield uh, Farms Yogurt, and I was able to uh, have them share them with me. So they're about maybe eight years old at this point. Other questions? Hi everyone, I'm trying to load up some questions up on my screen, so you should be see seeing that, and then Peter will be able to see it. What we're having right now is um, Peter, right before the presentation started, um, he was getting audio, and then all of a sudden he stopped getting the audio, and we couldn't uh, resolve it quickly enough, and we were working during the webinar to resolve it. So um, I'm just going to uh, show a list of the questions, and Peter can go ahead and answer them. So our next question is, um, how um, have you encountered a lot of legal slash bureaucratic red tape that uh, is delaying yes, down uh, the process? Yes, there's always the issue of legal red tape, but it's oftentimes it's getting the people in a room and establishing a level of trust, which is why we try and emphasize having facilities where folks interact with each other within a park or within a business setting, uh, pe people from different companies establishing that level of trust which is necessary to have a collaborative effort. Uh, the eco-industrial project in Texas, um, there's some stuff going on in Austin right now, but there's also a uh, cement uh, 
company which uses some uh, byproducts in its uh, manufacturing uh, process. Elements in the zero energy housing. Uh, the zero energy housing included uh, very strict energy conservation elements uh, and uh, one by uh, 16 uh, wall pieces and then uh, the ability to put uh, photovoltaic on top to just push them over the uh, the edge into being zero energy, but it was really a very tight envelope. Uh, EcoStar is run through by the by the city of Devons, but we set it up as a not-for-profit. So uh, it was created by a municipality, and now it's set up as a, a non-profit. Uh, there are other uh, vacant military bases around the country that have looked at doing similar types of uh, redevelopment based on sustainability. There's actually a national model, which is the Presidio, uh, and uh, we think they, they've done a fabulous job. They don't incorporate eco-industrial development, but uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, reluctant uh, elected officials, they need uh, <laughs> cuddling <laughs> and uh, education. It's difficult to uh, take on yeah, education to And uh, I think it, the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you can show economic advantage, you can overcome a lot of their concerns. Okay. Uh, the federal and state funds uh, went toward remediating the uh, Superfund site the feds left us. Um, we have put in about $250,000 over five years as a municipality. Yeah. So the Preserve Toothbrush firm pays for the return postage for their products to be reused, which is a pretty interesting uh, concept. Again, it's product take back. It's what is the law in Germany. All of the uh, car plants actually have to disassemble their cars when they're done and uh, reuse the components. 
it's pretty neat. Uh, so product take back is the concept and it's being put in place by these five firms. How often do you find that prices for green materials are the same or less expensive than other materials? I've not been able to find any comparable pricing for green materials in my area. That requires a lot of research uh, and it is uh, difficult uh, to do, but uh, and I don't have a, a, a source to jump to right away, but uh, in Massachusetts, there, uh, the state government actually has a sort of green materials environmentally preferable uh, purchasing list, and they have requirements for recycled content and green content, and that might be a place to start. Okay, so the collection of waste for repurposing. Purposing. It's basically kept on site in each uh, of the companies and marked uh, separately. And then on uh, Treasure Day, Donna will come by with folks on their milk run and pick it up. Or there will be other arrangements made between the companies separately to uh, transport the uh, repurposed material. The uh, commuter rail stop, there's a question here about the commuter rail stop and how close it is to Devon's. The commuter rail stop is about uh, uh, a quarter mile away. Yes, uh, Chiverton, Rhode Island has a wind power industrial park on the drawing boards. Present. Yeah. The Virginia Park was uh, set up for the Shenandoah uh, Valley area and included uh, a bunch of soccer fields, if I recall correctly. One has been the tube.
Okay, it seems like Peter has uh, responded that they haven't had any Tea Party problems to date, um, as far as uh, the question about having any problems or negativity with the Tea Party or Agenda 21 folks who don't like the term sustainable. Um, Uh, everyone, I'm, I'm very sorry, this is not going very smoothly. Um, we're really trying to work out the kinks here and uh, get this um, up and running. So if you can just bear with us, we'll try to continue on the question and answers. And I hope that um, what we've been doing so far has answered a lot of your questions. Hello? Hi, it's Peter Lowen. Yeah, Peter, we're hearing you. This has been a fun experience. <laughs> so we're in your questions. Um, everyone, we are we are trying to work out the kinks with uh, Peter's audio. He is not able to hear me um, speak, so normally I would go ahead and uh, pass on all the questions to him. So I'm trying to work out some sort of other method of getting the questions to him. And so the most recent question is the price difference in creating zero energy housing and stick belt housing. Um, the zero energy housing is actually cheaper than most of the market rate housing, at least that's the way it's been designed. It's a little smaller, it's about 1,800 square feet, whereas most single family houses in Massachusetts are 22, 24,000, uh, 2,400 square feet. Uh, the pricing is uh, is less expensive because that was the goal of the program to get between 80 and 120 percent of the median income uh, affordable. So EcoStar was sort of we created it before there was LEED certification and stuff. There are uh, commonalities in that what we're trying to do is uh, 
green the business sector. So it's probably more similar to some of the programs that ICWI runs and uh, some of the new lead certifications for communities that are being developed. So I think if you can get your business sector on board, your municipality should be uh, a greener place at the end of the day. We've done this with a fairly limited budget. We fund the program about $50,000 a year, and then the balance is funded from membership. Uh, the Philadelphia Naval Yard, is that set up as an eco-industrial park? I actually don't have that one on my list. The one I do have is in Bucks County where they redeveloped a former U.S. steel project and they marketed it as an eco-industrial park. In order to sort of make my list, they have to be on the media uh, somewhere on the internet and marketing themselves as an eco-industrial park. So another question is, could states legally mandate companies that work with hazardous chemicals to work locate in an eco-industrial park? Um, no, there's no way that uh, that could happen. But in Asia, the USAID actually is directing multinationals toward eco-industrial parks. Now again, we started this whole concept. It took off like wildfire in Asia, and then you know, sort of the Bush administration came along, and we've had to sort of do things on our own. And now we're playing catch up again. Uh, but this was originally a US idea, got international traction, and uh, now we're playing catch up. So the social equity part. So we. Uh, do a number of things in that area. One is 25% affordable housing. Another is we support uh, nonprofit institutions such as a food pantry, uh, a women's shelter. Uh, we have a child care facility that's set up that has uh, spaces designated for folks who are uh, trying to transition back into the workforce. And um, we have uh, preferences for housing uh, uh, or the businesses that move into the area. They have to do proactive marketing to people who live in the, in the region and who work in our businesses first. So am I aware of eco-industrial coordination being pursued among existing and prospective companies within the city or jurisdiction as a whole? Yes, and that's sort of called eco-industrial networking. So Kansas City, Kansas is doing that. There's a program in Mobile. There was a program in Chicago. There's one in Portland. A lot of these sort of larger network programs in the U.S. are supported by the U.S. Business Council for Sustainable Development. They actually have a program where they'll come into your community uh, and work with the city to set up sort of a regional network of exchanges, byproduct exchanges. So hopefully that will be uh, an effective resource if you wanted to look at it on a citywide basis. What are the main administrative uh, problems encountered by damage management in the eco-industrial park? Have the problems become less severe since the project started? Uh, the first problem was educating folks. I came in in uh, 99 after the project had been going for three years. Uh, it took me a couple of years to get everybody on page with uh, implementing the goal of sustainable development through using an eco-industrial park as a tool. Uh, so after that educational hurdle, there was the funding hurdle, which we had to wait a couple of years to start our programs uh, until Bristol-Meyer came in and uh, brought in a sufficient revenue stream for us to launch the programs. 
but once that's happened, we've been uh, doing fairly well since then. Another question is, is there any type of requirement to obtain a level of lead for development in an eco-industrial park? Uh, no, not within ours, but there is within some of the other parks around the uh, country. There are parks that require that their members be ISO 14000 certified, which is sort of the environmental quality assurance certification. Uh, program. And we have a green building component of our EcoStar program, which you get points if you get LEED certified within the park. So other than size, why is zero housing less expensive? Well, if you're actually in the Massachusetts area, we're going to have a tour of uh, the facilities and we'll give you dinner if you want to come and explore that uh, more thoroughly, give me an email. If you're not, uh, I'll send an email to Neil Angus who's on our uh, contact list. He's sort of my green building expert. He's a lead AP and I think he can, he can drill down into that for you. A private sector champion set. Uh, we have a private sector champion and a critical mass of participants. Um, I've been sort of the public sector champion of this project here at Devons. On the private side, we have had a number of uh, managers who have supported the project and would fill that role. Uh, some of them have been promoted because of their participation and left which has hurt us, but uh, assisted their company. Uh, the public money uh, infusion is still necessary and will be for a few more years uh, to uh, support the, uh, the project and to fund our EcoStar program director. Again, it's set up as a nonprofit. We fund 50000 The rest comes from memberships and from grants. We've received a number of grants recently. I don't expect that to continue. Uh, and we expect it to be self-sufficient in about three or four years. OK. So the permit process, how does that work? That's a question that's been asked. We have an expedited unified permit process in Devons, which is one of the attractions to the site. Um, we will give you one permit that covers wetlands conservation issues, forest health issues, variances, uh, site plan approval, and uh, authorizations to apply for a building permit and historic district approval. So it's a, a unified one-stop permitting shop, which is very, very attractive. Uh, if you build in an existing building and don't add more than uh, five parking spaces, you have a 21-day permitting process. And that would cover things like your saying and your question tenant improvements uh, or the minor changes to the uh, facility. So the 21-day permit process is for less than five building five parking spaces or less. So my favorite example of the shared marketing is the Give Me Five program, which I've uh, seen blossom from participants in the Londonderry Eco Industrial Park that I'd worked at before I came to Devils. Uh, we try and leave a lot of these things to the companies to handle. We give them ideas, but we don't try and be too intrusive. One of the educational programs that we provided for our participating members is we had a, 
professor from Tufts come out uh, talk about communicating your environmental success, how to put together uh, products for your suppliers, customers, and other industries to talk about your participation in a program like the COSTAR. Uh, we do have required parking calculations. We have a parking maximum. You cannot exceed the number of parking spaces. All of our information is on our website, uh, www.gevinsec.com, and you can use the search function and go to parking, and it'll bring up all of that information. You can check both the zoning bylaws and our regulations. It's fairly typical. Yes, we do have a landscape being component integrated into our regulations. Uh, low impact development, uh, stormwater management really works wonderfully. And uh, there are a number of model stormwater management bylaws that are available in Massachusetts that we consulted in developing our regs. We will have our new low-impact development regs on our website in October after we uh, get them updated at a public hearing at the end of the month. The current ones don't go into enough detail. Uh, we hope that the new ones will do so. My favorite landscaping uh, ordinance is the green area factor in the city of Seattle. If you haven't heard of it, take a look on their website. It's way cool. Uh, the last question was, could these eco-industrial parks be designed to operate on a quid pro quo basis so that the companies within limits and rules be allowed to purchase additional or special services over and above a tax payment under binding agreements, of course. There are there was an attempt to do that under the Clinton administration. Uh, they were going to uh, set up a program where you could get an umbrella permit, an environmental umbrella permit for your park. Uh, that never went anywhere. And I think this is more about setting up private sector agreements uh, between companies. You can exchange things vertically with other corporations in terms of hazardous materials can flow vertically uh, in, an, in an organization that can't flow outside of it. And there was an attempt made to address that by the Clinton administration can't ever keep the work. So there's a question again about the Philadelphia Naval Yard. It is, I characterize eco-industrial parks by how they characterize themselves. If they call themselves an eco-industrial project, I will list them. I do not have the Navy Yard listed as such a project. I do have a Bucks County eco-industrial park that was done uh, at a former U.S. steel site. I think it's the Perilous U.S. steel site in Bucks County, which identifies an eco-industrial park. It is extremely uh, successful from all of the press and the record. OK, 
Okay, well, that's pretty much all of the questions we had um, come in. If your question wasn't answered, uh, you can go ahead and email it to Peter Lowitt, that's P-E-T-E-R-L-O-W-I-T-T, -T, at devonsec, D-E-V-E-N-S-E-C, dot com. And I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, so th for those of you that are still in attendance, I just want to thank you for bearing with us. Um, this was a uh, this was a an, an interesting webinar. We've been yeah. having some difficulties that we haven't really had um, previously, and it just goes to show you that no matter how many practice runs you have, you can always come up, you can always run into some, some problems. So uh, first off, to log your CM credits. Uh, for attending today's webinar, uh, go to www.planning.org slash cm and uh, select today's date, which is uh, Thursday, September 8th. And then you can also select today's webcast, which uh, was what economic development planners should know about eco-industrial development. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And we are also recording today's webcast um, and a Recording of the webcast along with a six slide per page PDF will be available um, at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive. Um, and this does conclude today's session. Uh, thank you everybody for um, attending and uh, bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Thanks, Joe. Thank <sighs>